in seating, you can uh, see we have a, a PowerPoint that will provide a visual window into uh, some of the parts of the world and things that uh, Dr. Kim Tan has, has, um, has been up to of late. So we'll have that with Kim, and then we'll actually have this group reconvene on this side of the, of the, of the table, and we'll hear from Bishop Zach and have a conversation. Um, couple quick thoughts. One is that um, cognizant that yesterday, in some ways, sort of started out with a little bit more didactic look at existing trends in society, as opposed to a more overt uh, look at, at religion. Um, but you know whether that's anti-Semitism here in France that Mark told us about, which does couple with far-right populism and Islamism and has a certain, um, a certain religious thread, um, and then zooming out more broadly into Europe that Jeff walked us through, uh, or um, the conversation about global populism that Matt and Ed led us through with sort of even, even larger, wider lens, uh, there's a sense in which um, even that bundling economics and politics and culture, uh, even that um, uh, you know, religion plays a role that is a more subtle thread. It's a little bit of a duller color if it's, if it's a color on a tapestry, right? Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not bright. It's not, it's not quite as obvious. But even the sort of wistfulness, the near religious wistfulness, returning to the olden days of Weimar Germany or make America great again, that sort of psychological religious longing, um, you know, in some ways maybe, maybe it's, it's there. But in both those conversations, um, it wasn't as bright. Um, so even if Christians, Christians are preaching as they did, we were talking yesterday until 50 years ago that the Jews killed Christ and there's a certain religious thread, or again, the Islamist uh, piece, um, it's, it's, um, it's maybe not quite as bright as we're gonna talk overtly about some of, of, of the religious uh, realities in the world today. Um, and by the way, this happens with other faith angle things too, like we had a thing last, last month in, in Napa and had a conversation on polarization and technology and on race, and religion plays a more subtle role, but we think it's, we're trying to make the case that it's part of the story, that it's a part of the story worth uh, highlighting and, and uh, observing. Um, we do, by the way, have a podcast. I didn't mention about that yesterday. Um, but we have a podcast, and Ed Luce did one that just dropped this morning um, with BHL. Um, glad to report. And Matt Goodwin did one with Henry Olson of the Washington Post uh, two years ago on uh, his book, um, uh, um, National Populism. And we're trying to cultivate an ecology, an ecosystem of other opportunities, including for younger journalists. We have this Michael Cromarty forum that we'll bring back in the summer. Uh, that's part of a ways to kind of get on-ramped uh, into a, a larger community of, of, of journalists uh, like yourselves, um, just worth noting. And so um, as we're diving in then today to some things that are a little bit more explicitly religious, um, we're doing so through the lives of two uh, exempt, ex exceptional human beings um, and leaders, a global business leader with a massive heart for the world's poor and marginalized, and a cleric in Uganda who has pivoted in more recent years his work from uh, work exclusively in the church to the ways that um, religion impacts all of, of culture, including public life. Uh, so when we first reached out to uh, Dr. Kim Tan of Spring Hill Management, uh, someone who has invested significant sums of his own and his own company's uh, resources to foster uh, an extensive African and Malaysian network of self-sustaining entrepreneurial businesses that allow for wealth creation and not merely charity. I had in mind a kind of an entrepreneurial capitalism AEI type talk, you know, how uh, enterprise, not aid, is better, uh, how develop is better, development is better than, than charity. But as we all got talking, um, the plot thickened a little bit. And we thought instead of just talking about some of those themes, um, bureaucracy versus on the ground uh, uh, entrepreneurship, um, there may be a little more, a little bit more to say, uh, a window. So I hope uh, that, that both uh, he and Bishop Zach will give us some of that, um, but also that we'll get a, a window into some of the ways that religion is functionally, functioning um, consequently, either for good or for ill uh, in the world uh, today. Um, and <clears throat> uh, perhaps some ways that on the other side of that, um, they see possibilities for renewal. A bit of background on Kim, who will speak first. Um, including his PowerPoint. Kim invented uh, and secured an early patent on sheep monoclonal antibodies. Um, he runs today an international private management fund and works with impact funds in London, Kenya, Singapore, and the United States. He founded a cancer hospital in Malaysia uh, and in the UK where he's today based. 
He's both a member of the UK Society, Royal Society for Medicine. Uh, he's a pro-chancellor at the University of Surrey, and he's a past board member of the Saracens Rugby Club. He also played rugby for two years, uh, so there you have it. Um, and then immediately following, after we readjust the sheets, the seats, excuse me, um, uh, Bishop Zach uh, is a brilliantly educated cleric from Uganda who's seen a lot, including the negative toll of COVID in his own country, uh, which has led to some very felt uh, local unrest in recent months. Um, he served for 25 years in the Ugandan church, the Diocese of Kampala. He's been active in training fut future uh, ministry students there. He previously served as the regional director of the Church Mission Society in Africa, giving him uh, pretty clear eyes to the dynamics around aid and development uh, in the country. He's today a senior fellow at the Institute of Religion, Faith, and Culture. Uh, and at the Ugandan Christian University, he launched in 2012 a campus initiative uh, fostering deeper connections between faith in Uganda and the culture at large. Lots of journalists, they say, don't get religion, um, as the old phrase goes. Um, but this morning, perhaps a bit more directly than yesterday, hope you'll enjoy uh, taking in some firsthand accounts of the application of religion in criminal justice systems and prisons, questions of climate change, anti-poverty, economic wealth creation efforts, um, particularly from Kim, and then in personal story and the life of the church in Uganda in all its gritty reality and marvelous glory uh, uh, from Bishop Zach. Dr. Kim Tan, thank you for coming to Faith Angle and the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh, good morning. If I may, I'll stand. Um, it's always dangerous for a venture capitalist to be in the midst of journalists, so be kind. Um, and also on behalf of the Templeton Religion Trust uh, trustees, uh, we're really pleased to be supporting uh, this event. Uh, I have pulled together some slides of some of the kind of projects that we've been involved with. Uh, and a common theme, some common themes running through would be using an enterprise approach to tackle some of the social challenges that we have, tackling some of the uh, marginalized groups, uh, be they children, low-cost educations in the slums, or uh, women rescued from the sex industry, or prisoners in, in prisons. Um, a common theme also running through would be that of restoration, restoration of habitat or the environment, restoration of broken lives, of broken relationships. but they all come together because they, they are all integrated in this framework that I have about human flourishing. What do we need for human to, to really flourish? Well, we need the environment, and I'll say something about that because we're just still having COP26, um, but not just the natural environment, but also the local environment. Slums are not good environments for human flourishing. When our kids are running around in, in, in sewers, um, you know, it is just not a good place for humans to develop. So, so we need to tackle that. Then the dignity of work, and that's what fuel a lot of these other issues. If we don't have health, don't have good housing, education, we don't have technology. We need technology to help us with human flourishing. And then we need beauty. We need the arts. You know, yesterday morning, those of you who were up um, at seven in the morning, the, the sunrise was was magnificent. Right? And we need something of that beauty, something of that art for us to, to flourish. And then I believe also we need the, the spirituality uh, and an and, and understanding, uh, a sense of the transcendence. But this is where, where I started about 20-something years ago now, uh, became disillusioned with my own philanthropy, moving from running a, a biotech venture capital fund to running now what we now call social impact funds. And, and this is the kind of data that really was quite disturbing for me. The red line is, is a 30-year uh, uh, scale here. Red line is the amount of aid that has gone into sub-Saharan Africa over those 30-year period. As aid has increased, the GDP of these countries have actually decreased. So that was sc scary and frightening. Um, and, and that was what started me on a journey to say, me writing more checks uh, in terms of charity wasn't really going to transform anything. And having come and grew up in Malaysia, seeing the tiger economies in Asia transform themselves without aid, without philanthropy, we still have very few foundations uh, out there. Uh, but through people coming into our countries, uh, 
building small, medium-sized enterprises, the SMEs, uh, and over time, uh, in, uh, employing our people, and then stimulating a whole generation of local entrepreneurs who then went out to build further businesses. That's what has transformed uh, these countries in Asia. 45 years ago, the GDP of Kenya and Ghana was higher than the GDP of Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Taiwan, Hong Kong. It's just 45 years ago. Okay? So I, I, I became challenged that just when you have money, writing a check is easy, but giving your time is really very difficult and more challenging. And so that began a journey uh, 20 years ago of doing this. Just some classifications. These are the kind of categories broadly. Uh, we talk about ethical investing. Ethical investing to me is just do no harm investing. It's neg negatively screened, you know, no drugs, no uh, pornography, uh, no cigarettes, and so on. So it's just do no harm, which is fine. And now we have what we call ESG investing, uh, environmental, uh, social, and governance type. And this I what I call do less harm. There are no perfect ESG companies out there. Right? Just got to appreciate this is a transition that we're going through. And you know, even with renewable energy, uh, lithium mining is pretty, pretty horrible. <laughs> right? So for all the talk about renewables and so on, we just got to be aware that, that this, is, this is not perfect yet. So it's do less harm. Where we're working is really in the, what is now called impact investing. Uh, and this is intentionally doing good, rather than just do no harm or do less harm. This is intentionally going in, looking at a social issue, or a need, rural uh, poverty or urban poverty, and saying, can we design businesses that are sustainable instead of doing aid and doing charity? And even here, we are seeing two kind of areas in impact investing. What people now call impact investing is largely about sustainability, which is fine, which is great. Uh, and we need to do more of that. But what, what I want to concentrate on this morning is what we are calling social impact investing, which is really tackling poverty as our primary objective. So some examples. Um, this was the, the first uh, investment I made down in South Africa uh, in a region of 85% uh, unemployment at the time we were there. 30% HIV AIDS, um, and really, as a philanthropist, I could have built a school, a clinic, an orphanage, and all those are good things to do, and we need to do a lot more of them. But I knew doing those things wasn't going to shift the needle. So what could we do there? A long story, in the end, bought 40,000 acres of badly degraded farmland to convert into a game reserve, a safari game reserve, built a five-star lodge on it, and to see if we could use an, a, a tourism approach to stimulate the economy um, and, uh, and do conservation and fund the conservation uh, out of the profits uh, from the hospitality. And that's exactly what we, we've done. Fenced about 75 kilometers of elephant-proof fencing and then brought big game into that park for the first time in 150 years, not knowing whether they'll like being there, whether they'll breed, right? And also building a lodge there in, in the middle of nowhere, not knowing whether tourists would come, whether guests would come. And also not knowing whether we could go and hire AIDS orphans. These are kids whose parents have died when they were teenagers, heads, heads of the family, very little education. Can we upskill and train them can we create an environment for them to flourish so that they can become you know, good at looking after five-star guests? Um, we used local material wherever we could, and I ended up really discovering conservation. I didn't go into this really wanting to do conservation. We were about tackling poverty in, in a district. Um, but in the end, the, the profits from the lodge have come to sort of help us run a bunch of conservation programs on some endangered species there. Um, elephants certainly uh, breed very happily, uh, and so do cheetahs. Uh, all our game reserves in South Africa are largely in fence areas, and they've become very inbred. Uh, and so we've been doing quite a lot of DNA genetics uh, profiling to try and 
bring new genetics uh, into, these, into these parks. And in the last couple of years, bred about nine new cheetahs with new genetics now introduced into nine new reserves. But the real reason for that being there was really poverty. Uh, this is how our people used to live. Today they live in these kinds of houses. Uh, and, and we define standard housing as concrete floors, solid walls, water, electricity, indoor bathroom, flush toilet, and solar panel. I want to know over the period of my investment how many start to have standard housing. Right? Because housing is, is a, a, a surrogate marker for health. Health is very difficult to measure uh, as an outcome. Uh, but housing is really correlated very well uh, with, with health. And we fence about 1,500 acres uh, of, of an educational park because I realized very early on that our black children, our African children, have never seen game in the wild. They've seen, they've seen animals in books, they've seen animals on television, but they've never had the experience of seeing game in the wild. So one of the things we do is we bust them in. Uh, there, there's a, a shed there with all the animals, stuffed animals and bones and dung and everything else. And they come in for our day to learn and be inspired uh, about conservation. And the beauty is we have non-dangerous animals on this park uh, and um, they get to walk with giraffes. They get to walk with antelope. And that's just a stunning way of inspiring, educating uh, these children. This is too complex a, a, a slide to talk through, but this is kind of metrics that we measure over time. We look at gender, male, female. We look at the average salary, uh, excluding managers. Because one of the ways we can make profits is by squeezing and exploiting our staff. Right? So I want to make sure that we are seeing an increase over time uh, with, uh, with, with the basic salary. Uh, we measure how much, we, how much taxes we pay. Uh, we measure how many children now uh, are able to go to tertiary education. How many start to, to own a, a motorbike, start to own a house, start to own a car. So, so those are some of the kind of metrics that we measure. That's our strap line. Help the poor, come on safari. Don't write as a charity check. You know, come, come and enjoy safari. Another thing in relation to COP26 is, is a big reforestation program. We've got big, big areas, about 14,000 acres of degraded land that we're slowly planting this particular shrub uh, called speck boom. We're taking the learnings out of that now, to, uh, and, you know, but for the pandemic, we're taking it into two other uh, forests, one in Budungo where there are about 600 chimpanzees left. This is in Zach's country uh, in uh, Uganda. Uh, and also in Bindi, where there are about 400 gorillas left. But the deforestation uh, in Bindi is unsustainable. And once the forest goes, um, the animals will go too. And I'm particularly pleased that with COP26, not only has there been an emphasis on decreasing the, the, the uh, carbon CO2 emission, but they are beginning to have an understanding that we actually need these forests. You can have as much renewable energy as you like, but if we continue to, to clear a million acres or so of forests every year, we're never going to get to net zero. So, so these habitats are really, really important. But the way we've been doing this kind of conservation work has been just to, to sort of do it in silos. You know, save the elephants, uh, save the lions, save the tigers, whatever. The problem with that is that if the community around you are hungry, they will chop your trees. They will shoot your game. And, and so unless you address the hunger issue, no amount of AK-47s that we give our rangers will be able to stop this kind of deforestation and destruction of the habitat. So we, t what we need to take a more holistic approach. We need to address the, the human hunger. Um, and uh, so that's what we're doing. There's another one that's related to, to, to forest. Um, in Zambia, northern Zambia, we have a, a honey business. We have 90,000 beehives working with about 9,000, 10,000 farmers. And if each farmer looks after about 20 or, or so beehives, it doubles their annual income. But the, the beauty of this is we went again to tackle the poverty issue. 
How do we increase the livelihood of these uh, farmers? The, the side benefit of this, we put uh, uh, one of these uh, beehives in about uh, an acre or so, a uh, hectare or so of, of, of forest. So we've ended up really protecting about 90,000 hectares of forest. Uh, because now that they have an income from these hives, they don't chop their trees anymore and they protect their trees. Uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, business uh, that we have in, in Asia. This is a, a, a plant called uh, Canaf. Grows is a, is a, a part of the hibiscus family. It grows really, really fast. We uh, can harvest about twice a year. Uh, the real value of the, of the Canaf are these fibers. So you strip out the fibers. They're long and strong. And uh, they're used for car, uh, in the car industry. Uh, Toyota particularly, if you have a Toyota, you've got this plant in, in your car, uh, either as uh, insulation or as biocomposites for car interiors. But the core has traditionally just been a waste product. They've just thrown it away and, and, and burn it. These guys have, have taken the core, chipped it, and mixed with lime to build houses with. And, um, and you can build these in, in, in panels in the factories, and then come and then just assemble them three, four days, and you have a house. So genuinely greenhouse, it's already captured carbon. No sand, no cement. Um, I think, David, I, I don't know whether you remember, the New York Times carried a long series on sand mining, uh, the environmental impact of sand mining. Uh, it was my niece uh, who, who, who did that piece there. And, and, and we've run out of sand, basically, for house building. The kind of sand in the Sahara is, not, is too round, too fine for, 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 for building. So here is, here is a, 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 an innovative technology uh, that doesn't require sand and no cement. Those of you who remember your chemistry, lime will carry on capturing carbon and becomes calcium carbonate, which is stone. These houses actually become stronger with age rather than our concrete houses that sort of deteriorate uh, with age. Uh, Green Hope is a business we have in Indonesia uh, where, we have, where we work with over 3,000 farmers uh, to produce cassava that we use for making biodegradable plastics. So you all know the challenges of plastics um, that we have in our seas and in our, in our rivers uh, and in our landfills. Uh, Kentegra is another one uh, in Kenya. Um, this is organic. Uh, in, insecticides. This is pyrethrum, which is ext extracted from the flowers. Um, uh, farmers dry the flowers, they come, we weigh, we pay, uh, and then we extract. And, and, and we now export this uh, out, of, uh, out of Kenya. I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is um, uh, a computer training center, six months to get a Microsoft certificate. Uh, in the slums in South Africa, in, in the Eastern Cape and, and Western Cape. Sanergy. Uh, toilets. So those of you who are familiar with the slums will, you know, these are scenes that you'll be familiar with. We have a model where we franchise these kinds of toilets to these micro-entrepreneurs. People pay 50 Canadian shillings uh, to, to, to use. We currently have about almost 4,000 uh, toilets scattered around um, Kabira slums in Nairobi um, and uh, serves about 140,000 people uh, daily uh, with clean toilet facilities. But if you look at the economics, this just doesn't pay. The only way to make this profitable is to take the waste away to convert it into organic fertilizer, and that's what we do, and then also to turn it into an insect protein. So this is a fly called black soldier fly. They lay their eggs on poo. Um, and when the larvae hatches, the larvae will also feed on poo. And we harvest the larvae and use it as a protein substitute instead of fish meal in animal feed. As you know, fish stock around the world is, is declining. So this is actually going to be the most valuable product uh, out, of, out of this kind of waste. Uh, so, uh, I've been accused of running some pretty shitty businesses. This is the shittiest of them all. Um, and, and it's human waste together with food waste from hotels uh, and vegetable waste from, 
uh, pineapple plantations and so on. So this is the, the factory where we can now handle about 70,000 uh, tons of, of, of protein production a year. Some of you may know about Bridge uh, International Academies. Um, it's been written up uh, several times now as a case study. Um, here it, it's just using technology to provide low-cost education for kids. Uh, we, we spend very little money on the, on the infrastructure, um, $30,000, $40,000 to build these kinds of schools. And, and by the way, my first school in rural Malaysia is just like this. Uh, my first school in Malaysia, my parents were immigrants. Uh, we were poor. I grew up poor. Um, and this was my first school uh, in uh, the rubber plantation in, in rural Malaysia. And it just shows that it's not the infrastructure that matters. It's investing in the teachers. It's investing in the software. And if you have good, inspiring teachers, you know, kids can still achieve things. Uh, but often we just spend too much time just, you know, investing in all this infrastructure and we forget that what's needed is actually uh, the software uh, inside. So we use uh, all our, our curriculums on, on uh, tablets. Parents pay us by mobile money. We pay uh, teachers and suppliers by mobile money and we pay them on time and that's the, that's the key. Many of our, our government school teachers don't get paid on time in Africa. Uh, and hence, teacher absenteeism can run for anywhere from 45% to 55%. They're not in class to teach. And when they come to, to the class anyway, they're pretty demoralized, uh, not, not really incentivized to, to teach. We charge $5 per child per month. This started with one school uh, in 2009, 2008 in Mukuru in Nairobi. Today, um, Bridge now has over five and a half thousand schools with a million kids uh, in our schools uh, on a daily basis, pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, we don't know how many are coming back. So far, about 700,000 uh, kids are back, back in school. So this is all tackling this challenging issue. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. This is a, a, an, an ad tech uh, business we have in Indonesia providing uh, uh, books and, 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 and videos of, of lessons to, to, to kids uh, in, in, in Indonesia. Two million users a month now. Paygo, um, this is a, a smart meter that sits on top of a cylinder, a gas cylinder. We're trying to convert people from using wood and charcoal into using gas. We supply a, a, a double hop and they use a mobile phone to uh, release the right amount of gas that they, that they need for the day. And then when the gas level drops to a certain level here, uh, it sends a signal back to base and will come and uh, replace the, the cylinder. Um, and, and these are the kinds of places that we supply uh, the gas to. Um, and you, know, you, you can't get a bicycle in, you can't get a motorbike in even, so you have to walk. So we, we designed these uh, pouches, these carrier bags for, for, for our agents to carry uh, gas into these kinds of uh, environments. We're trying to move them out of gas now into solar induction cookers. Uh, we have you know, a number of, of uh, solar businesses already uh, in, in Africa, but we're just looking at one now to do um, solar induction cookers. Um, this was a response to COVID. Uh, we have a, a, a business in Thailand manufacturing low-cost uh, tests, rapid tests for dengue fever, malaria, HIV, syphilis, and in the last, last year we developed one for uh, COVID as well as a response to, to the, the pandemic. Two final stories, Regenesis rescues, uh, uh, employees rescued women from the sex industry, upskills them to do photo editing for real estate companies in the U.S. So the guys in the U.S. take the photos of these buildings, downloads the, the data to the Philippines. These uh, girls just do the photo editing and ship it back. And they do a sort of 3D sort of uh, plan as well, a guide to, to the building. Employs about 200, uh, 200 women. Cable of, sc uh, of, of scaling, obviously, as well. And finally, Agape uh, is a business uh, in the prison, in the largest prison in Singapore, so called Changi. And there we run a call center. Uh, we employ uh, 80 men and 100 uh, women. 
We pay them the minimum wage in Singapore, which is about 600 US dollars a month. Not bad because accommodation is free, food's free. Uh, what's great about this is the efficiency is fantastic. They all come to work on time uh, and they go off work on time too. Um, and one of the things we're seeing is once they get, get, have some pay, they can start to send money back to their families. Family starts to visit them because once they're in prison, they just disown. Right? They start to, to visit them and they, they, they have that sort of restoration of that relationship. And then when they're released, we rehire them in a cult center. Um, and, and one of the great things that we're discovering is the sense of community, a sense of belonging. Often when these ex-prisoners come out, they, they try to hide their backgrounds, right? But it, with us in the city, um, everyone just about is an ex-con. CEO is an ex-con. The CFO is an ex-con. The head of training is an ex-con. So nobody needs to hide their backgrounds. They feel accepted. They don't feel judged. And, and, and that's the kind of environment that we're creating for them to flourish, for them to grow. We have one kid now who's wanting to be a lawyer, studying, studying law at night, in night school, uh, wants to be a lawyer. Uh, I asked him why. He says, so we can defend other prisoners. OK, that's a great objective. Um, so, so looking at these kinds of, of challenging marginalized groups and saying, instead of me just writing a check for charity, can I put in the time and the expertise to, to build a sustainable business that will give them dignity, right? give them independence, um, and allow them to develop uh, to, to their full potential? Um, and, and that's really what this kind of social impact investing is about. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, well, can I invite um, the rest of you to please find your seat at the table again, and um, we'll hear from Bishop Zach, and then have a conversation. Kim, while, there, uh, return, while we're returning to our seats, um, can you name in a sentence or two uh, how that um, investment strategy is related to your religious faith? Yeah, you know, Josh, we can't take anything with us when we die, when we go, right? So we spend so much time trying to sort of build more and more and get more and more. And uh, so, you, you know, I got to a point in my life where I just realized, yeah, I could have gone on to, to run another biotech VC fund. Um, but, you know, I, I've got more than enough to live on. Um, and well, and, um, and it's a case of using my talents. Um, because I believe that at the end of, of when I face my maker, my creator, uh, I'm going to have to be asked to give an account of the gifts and talents and resources that he's given me. And I want to be able to say I've done more than just build my own empire um, and, uh, you know, have nice houses and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, my faith is, is, is integral uh, to, to all, that, uh, all that we're doing. It's what keeps us motivated to keep going out. I mean, these are tough places to go to and spend time. Um, and uh, so without, without the faith to sort of motivate me and push me on, I think it'd be difficult. Thank you. Bishop Zach. Um, thank you very much. Um, truly delighted and want to say thank you, um, Josh and your team uh, for inviting me. Um, I count it a, a privilege a responsibility. Um, I must be honest, it was a surprise to me, uh, given that uh, it was very clear that this, the focus of this conversation uh, is, is Europe. So, and, uh, and yesterday's conversation uh, augmented that. But uh, uh, my excitement is really this line uh, in who you are, the faith angle. And um, 
very grateful because right from my childhood, I learned from my father and my mother uh, that to be a follower of Jesus, that that faith uh, has implications in all of life, in all of life. And that, because uh, my father was a first generation uh, uh, Christian, um, the first one to um, be a follower of Jesus uh, in a wider clan. Um, and um, then he went on to be a teacher, preacher, uh, planted several churches in the villages of southwestern Uganda. Um, a man ahead of his time, because of his faith, he learned uh, Kiswahili, he learned Luganda. He, I mean, he, he, he really told me that um, to have faith is to seek to connect with everything that the almighty God has created and all the people. And so to learn language is itself an experience of faith. So very delighted, therefore, that the focus of this conversation is, is faith. The faith angle. And right from the onset, I think it's important for me to clarify that it's the faith angle and not a religious angle. And um, when I learned that my brother and friend, uh, Kim, was going to be here, it was another motivation. Because my connection with Kim was really a connection of faith. Uh, he and I connected uh, over an angst about charity not transforming the world. As I told him, eight stories in the early uh, 2000, must be 2003, 2004, uh, when we met and, and talked. And, and Kim, I'm really excited to see some of the things that have developed uh, from some of those conversations and the work we have done. Uh, together. But it was a connection of faith uh, that really, really brought us together. And our angst over uh, poverty in Africa, which has been my uh, concern. And, um, but this distinction, if I say nothing else, I really would like us to have a conversation on religion and faith and the distinction, because they are not the same. And I would like to encourage Europeans and Westerners to try and learn, especially from uh, other areas in which uh, Christianity, uh, these Western religions are still very young. Uh, many years ago in my own uh, pilgrimage and seeking to learn, I investigated as to the word, for example, uh, the, in the African languages, the word for religion. And from east to west, north and south, all over sub-Saharan Africa, there is not a single uh, community, uh, whether it's the Zulus or the Baganda or the Ekwe in, uh, 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 the, uh, in uh, Ghana, who actually have a word for religion, an equivalent. The adopted word uh, is Dini, which comes from the Arabic. And uh, because in our own traditions, it's not that we didn't have a faith, uh, but we actually didn't have religions in the sense of religions. And um, so this distinction is extremely important because there are ways in which religion as a concept is a foreign thing uh, for most societies uh, on the continent. That's not to say there is not a deep uh, faith uh, or what you might call religious impetus, uh, but that's a very important distinction to make. The distinction is essential, especially when considering societies where their DNA is diversity, multiple intersecting identities, uh, societies in which they do not have a shared, uh, shared faith traditions, shared faith traditions, or nationalities. Um, growing up, it may interest you that with the Roman Catholic missions and Protestant missions from uh, especially uh, uh, England, uh, the Church Mission Society and others, it's very interesting that we used to fill forms in primary school and there was a section of religion and religion wasn't Christianity. 
religion was Roman Catholicism, religion was Protestantism, and now there's a new religion called Pentecostalism. In other words, Christianity for us is not a standalone religion. The religions are Roman Catholicism, uh, Protestantism, and of course Islam, uh, which uh, predated uh, Christianity in my country. So this distinction is very critical, and I'll be explaining why it is also very critical, especially uh, because uh, this whole idea of how peoples who have uh, different identities uh, core to who they are, especially nationality uh, and uh, religious traditions, uh, how they can live together as diverse uh, peoples. And um, very often uh, really intrigued by the European experience in which uh, reading some of the history of uh, Christianity uh, on this continent, how it was often the case that uh, a nation had its own religion. So uh, the boundaries of the country were also the boundaries of uh, religious tradition. So you can talk about Lutheran countries, you can talk about Catholic countries in Europe, you can talk about, um, and so on and so forth. So this whole idea uh, uh, of homogeneity, uh, and sometimes I think that that's the one thing we can't uh, uh, really take too seriously from Europe. I, I argue that uh, if Europe taught anything to the world, it's tribalism. Um, and tribalism of an extremely deep, uh, deep end. So. Now, I grew up without making that distinction. I grew up not realizing that uh, Christianity was uh, a religion, but also Christianity was a faith, and that the two were not necessarily the same. In fact, I grew up having faith in Christianity as a force for public good. Of course, Christianity was the only faith tradition that I had been exposed to. Uh, in high school, I met uh, Muslims uh, in the same class, but they were a very despised minority in our school system. So I believed in Christianity, and I believed in Christianity as a force for good. And that was um, uh, kind of... Uh, 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 reinforced by my experience in high school, my experience uh, even at university. Because you see, in countries like mine, uh, school, the school system was founded on religious basis. So there were Protestant schools, there were Roman Catholic schools, uh, and then there were Muslim schools. And, and does that sound familiar uh, uh, in, in Europe? And um, so this whole idea that you developed a people uh, in which um, the other was not to be included. Um, and although uh, Christianity uh, and uh, religious traditions are credited for uh, being vanguards of education and healthcare, I think it is missed that the reason for that wasn't so that flourishing of human beings, but it was the whole idea of conversion. Is that how else do you have more converts? Let's build more schools. How else do you have more converts? Let's uh, make sure they come to our hospitals. So hospitals and schools were not so that uh, Africans could flourish, but it's so that Roman Catholicism, uh, uh, the Anglicans could become more. It is not surprising, therefore, that a country like Uganda or Kenya uh, or Nigeria or Liberia, uh, countries that were colonized by the British, are uh, predominantly, even though they have a very strong uh, uh, Christian traditions, uh, but especially, uh, and so the church I belong to is called the Church of Uganda, the Church of England. This whole idea that you, you, you take over a place and you have an established religion for that, that group of people. Um, uh, French colonies across the continent, uh, Roman Catholicism is, is the heyday. And in my country, one of the biggest issues in the politics of my country is that we've never had a Roman Catholic for a president. 
And the Roman Catholic Church is working day in and day out to make sure that one day Uganda has a Roman Catholic president. And everything else trumps uh, that whole vision. So this whole idea of society's people, this Western religion that came to redefine who we are, uh, is problematic. And I will be explaining the burden of religion as a huge issue, as a huge problem. And in, indeed, if I don't say it well, complicit to the entire uh, poverty agenda. Uh, the Africans are poor, not because Africa is poor, but Africans are poor because of plunder. Poverty is a project. The problem is not poverty for Africa. The problem is greed. And greed is also associated with religion. Uh, if I don't say that clearly, uh, I should just put it there. So, Growing up, therefore, I began to have deep questions about Christianity as a religion, especially in a context of political turbulence, uh, military repressive regimes, and violence. Idi Amin came on the scene, a Muslim uh, military officer, and 1971, I was in high school. 1974, uh, Uganda signed up as a member of the uh, Conference of Islamic Nations. And so since then, uh, Uganda is a signatory and a member and uh, really recognized as quote-unquote Islamic State uh, in spite of the different proportions. And I have argued in some of the work I have done that Idi Amin and the Islamization of Uganda was a creature of Christianity because it was a reaction to an established uh, Christianity and, um, I mean, if I tell you the religious wars uh, in Uganda, the first wars in my country in which guns were used, gunpowder, were religious wars between Roman Catholics, uh, Protestants, and then with Muslims, and I could go on. So this burden of religion is right at the very, very foundations of the nation state, the colonial nation state, uh, very problematic. And unfortunately, we continue to suffer with it. So these experiences began to shake my faith in Christianity uh, as a religion. And um, this was especially exacerbated when uh, I started work uh, on the continent initially as a student leader. Um, I um, was the coordinator for the student uh, work in universities and colleges across the continent. Uh, from in the, within the English and Portuguese speaking uh, African uh, countries. Uh, you know, again, um, uh, really, really uh, 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 shattered to see that some of the most violent and stable countries, this is in the 1990s and, and since then, were countries that could pride themselves to have a very big population that were religious, that were Christian, and some where you had a population, a significant population of Muslims and a significant population of Christians, the war of religion is vicious. The story of Nigeria is one such story, uh, the instability of that country. And these countries being divided along religious lines. And generally you have the north. I mean, there are enclaves of religion. Uh, Kenya is a very interesting uh, country in this whole religious thing. It's actually possible to be able to say, this ethnic group is Presbyterians. This ethnic group are Anglicans. That ethnic group are Roman Catholics. This idea, and it is a European idea, I think, that a particular nation uh, has a particular religion, and this uh, that was exported uh, by the missionaries uh, on the continent. So I travel across um, the continent, and this experience uh, uh, challenges me. Poverty is growing, not in the poorest countries, because if you think about Congo, uh, DRC, an extremely wealthy country uh, in terms of natural resources. Uh, think about Sierra Leone and the diamonds. All these stories you know. I don't have to get into them. Uh, but these are countries that are still battling with issues of poverty and I mean, if I tell you about the school systems of these countries, mine uh, is, a, is a, an example in that. In all these countries that I speak about in sub-Saharan Africa, you can't deny the presence of religion 
I mean, it's massive. A country like Uganda, 98% have a religious affiliation. 98%. This is Uganda. 85%, uh, uh, I think, around there would say, call themselves Christian. However, the uh, average age uh, by which a woman gets pregnant in my country is 15, 16 years. The dropout rates at primary school level, I'm just giving those as indicators of poverty. Um, by the way, we have a very young population in Africa. Uganda, 80% uh, of the population are 35 years and below. Very, very young. And I could say this for Niger, I could say this for, on average, I think on the continent, it's between 60 uh, to 70% on average across the continent, below 30, 35 years. Uh, very, very young, but very poor. Poor in a very rich uh, environment. Uh, so the presence of Christianity, and with the presence of Christianity, the presence of religion, Islam, Christianity to be specific, uh, there are exceptions on the, on the, on the continent. Uh, but together with that presence, the presence of injustices, corruption, repression, poverty, civil wars, and I could go on. So if that is true, there therefore must really be a problem with religion. So this faith that religion is an impetus for good uh, was um, expunged, and I began to struggle. Some of you might wonder, how then did you become a bishop? But grateful that as I began to delve deep into this, I was not the only one asking these questions. I'd like to recommend a book uh, by Professor Emmanuel Katongole, The Sacrifice of Africa. If you haven't re seen that book, please do. Emmanuel Katongo is the sacrifice of Africa. He teaches at uh, University of Notre Dame. And he too writes and says this, and I quote, that we should all be troubled, and I quote, why war, tribalism, and poverty, corruption, and violence have been endemic in Africa's social history, despite Christianity's overwhelming presence. In fact, it has failed to make a significant dent in the social history of the continent. Uh, Paul Gifford, um, I think uh, I was checking, he may have passed this year, a uh, remarkable professor in the social sciences, has also written that despite the growth of Christianity and the social activism of the churches, Africans are, in general, 40% worse off, and he was writing in 1998, than they were in 1980s. So this decay of African countries, African societies, uh, compared with the rising uh, tide uh, of religion. I think it's important to put a footnote here that this is not just an African problem. Because writing in the 1940s, uh, Howard Thurman, and I really was a chance to read this uh, excellent, excellent little book, um, Jesus and the Disinherited. And Howard Thurman, a grandson of slaves in America, wrote and he said this, and I quote, why is it that Christianity seems important to deal radically and therefore effectively with the issues of discrimination and injustice on the basis of race, religion, and national origin. This importance is due, is this importance, excuse me, is this importance due to a betrayal of the genius of religion, or is it due to a basic weakness in religion itself? And I think that that summarizes the question that I would hope we can grapple with. Is this importance due to a betrayal of the genius of religion, or is it due to a basic weakness 
in religion itself. The question is searching for the dramatic demonstration of the um, importance of Christianity particularly, but I would say the same uh, uh, in our societies in Africa vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Islam and other uh, uh, foreign religions uh, that came to our land. Uh, Christianity in dealing with the issue is underscored by its apparent inability to cope with it within its own fellowship. I have mentioned the wars between Roman Catholics and Protestants in my country uh, towards the turn of the uh, 19th century uh, as uh, the uh, missionaries from different orders were competing for the soul uh, of a people uh, in Uganda. So I discovered that therefore it is important for me uh, to find a different way of uh, thinking, understanding, and I found the whole idea of faith liberating. Because faith is about relationship. Religion is often about institutions, structures, systems, rituals, processes that delineate, that create us and them, creating separate, definable groups. And I'm not suggesting that we therefore must expand all religion. It's important to understand that religion itself is embedded within it some forms of politics of division, the building of wars, wars that divide a people. That's our experience uh, on the continent. And yet, faith as a relationship, faith as that which seeks the good in everyone. Why? Because if it's any faith at all, it's a connection, a relationship with the transcendent, and there is in each one, every human being, a transcendent reality. So to recognize transcendence is not just the transcendent of the other, creator, redeemer, sustainer, the invisible, but also the transcendence in each one of us, the recognition of that. And that itself is an act of faith. It is elsewhere spoken to as dignity, human dignity, and I'll come back to that thought uh, later. So, faith sees, faith has eyes that recognize uh, not the other, but one, a recognition of a shared humanity, a shared uh, solidarity as one human family. Why religion obscures. Religion is blind and often sees difference the other. And uh, I hope that that is not uh, uh, an oversimplification. But I'm suggesting these are the kinds of conversations we ought to have. This has been very important for me in the struggle for justice in my country. Uh, an Anglican bishop, when I made the choice to take an early retirement uh, in order to pursue the cause of justice, I was amazed that in that fellowship group, a group of whom we were committed to this cause, is I found some Muslim clerics that we could be in solidarity together. And I still can remember in the uh, 2003 when we were demonstrating on the streets of Kampala against corruption. I was together with a Muslim cleric. We stood together. In fact, in that year, I was uh, arrested uh, off the streets uh, violently and taken to jail and uh, spent uh, the better part of 24 hours uh, in jail for that. You will be amazed that subsequently, as I did my visits uh, that were required by the police, by the government, and I don't need to say much more, I was not visited by fellow bishops. It's actually my Muslim friend who came with me all the time I needed to visit the police. Why? Because we were both committed, because of faith, for the dignity of all Ugandans, irrespective of who they were. Not a single serving bishop in the Church of Uganda came along with me. In fact, I am told that the House of Bishops of the Church of Uganda had a conversation about my detention. Because when I went on the street, I was putting on a clerical shirt, you know, 
properly dressed, uh, not with the gowns. I, 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 I just, I whip the day when gowns were introduced. <laughs> I think it's such an archaic thing, but anyway, there we are. So anyway, but I was putting on a clerical shirt and so on. And I am told a discussion happened in the House of Bishops that Bishop Zach Niringye had desecrated the collar on the streets of Kampala. So to be an activist for social justice in the House of Bishops was a desecration of the collar. Friends, that's religion. And uh, this dear Muslim scholar, and I have several other friends uh, that I could speak about who are um, uh, Muslims. I can speak to you about very dear friends with whom we are passionate for the dignity of every Ugandan who are Roman Catholic fathers, Roman Catholic priests, Roman Catholic bishops. So my fellowship uh, on this path of justice, the dignity of every Ugandan, are not Anglicans. They are not Anglican bishops, but they are people of faith. People who see transcendence in every person and are committed to the dignity of every Ugandan. So, therefore, this distinction becomes uh, very crucial. Now, in somewhere in 2000, as I grappled with this, I, as I was giving up the whole agenda of religion and asking questions about how societies are transformed, and it's those times when I connected with my brother and others in uh, the Transformational Business Network. And uh, at that time, we began to think this mission thing, you know, mission, mission, mission. And the conversation at the time was, how do we think about business as mission? Business as mission. Not business for mission, not business to finance mission, but business itself, because business transforms societies. It's what creates employment. At that time, it became clear to me that actually societies are transformed by two things, which are twin fellows, by politics and business. Politics and business shape societies. And uh, as I delved deeper, I am not a political scientist. I'm just an activist seeking to see how societies can get better. So I chance to read something of uh, Harold Laswell's definition of politics. Who gets what, when, and how? And I have done a little bit more reading in this and really amazed this, these twin uh, 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 fellows, politics and business. And uh, you can therefore imagine as one who uh, uh, spent a lot of my time studying theology, mission history, uh, PhD. Uh, by the way, I didn't say that. I, I entered into this whole thing because of faith, because my first degree was physics. In fact, I was doing a master's in physics uh, when it became clear to me that I could never spend the rest of my life teaching physics at the university. So I was actually uh, a graduate fellow at Makerere University teaching physics as I pursued my master's. But because of faith, I thought, no, I mean, the world, you know, the world coheres. Uh, there can be many uh, people in the physics and so on. Isn't it? So, uh, as one who therefore spent the rest of my life not engaging with uh, nuclear and electronic and the stars and so on, but thinking deeply about how human beings connect with transcendence and how the Jesus story was the transforming story. So, read a lot, but I realized I needed to really get deeper into politics and business and how it works, hence the connection with the Transformational Business Network. How does and the joyful thing of that connection is that the people I met with, we didn't ask, are you Roman Catholics? Are you, are you Pentecostals? Are you seeking to build schools for Christians? No, it's for human beings. You know, it's for anybody and everybody. And um, I can tell you more stories uh, to that end. So the two things, politics and business. Then I, um, for a little while, because of this interest, um, the, uh, my story in the Church of Uganda is very interesting, but because when my church saw my interest in social justice and all this, they actually nominated me to a governance council of the country. I don't know how many of you will be conversant with the Africa peer review mechanism process, uh, which is a self-monitoring uh, peer review for governance and so on. So I was actually nominated by my church to, and then when I was nominated, I became the chair of the Africa peer review mechanism for Uganda. And so I used to go to uh, uh, the African Union uh, because there is, as part of the structure, 
uh, the panel, uh, sorry, the, the, the summit uh, of heads of state. So I would sit in that room with heads of state because the delegation for a country was the president, uh, maybe a minister responsible, then the chair of the, of the peer review mechanism. And uh, it was always fascinating sitting with these uh, Af African presidents as they discussed the future and the governance of Africa. So as I did that, um, I began to, uh, of course, become much more openly activist for social justice, the end of poverty. And so I was actually invited in uh, 2013 to be part of the group launching this book. Uh, this is a World Bank report, uh, Inclusion Matters, the Foundation for Shared Prosperity. And I read this book and I was amazed that the World Bank that hardly has, you couldn't really qualify the World Bank as a faith group. But amazed that the World Bank was using a language that is akin to faith. And the th overall theme for this is Foundations for Shared Prosperity. So I got interest. I, I recommend this book uh, as a number of others within this series because I think they strike at the heart of some of the conversations that we are having. Inclusion matters. This is a study uh, based on uh, uh, World Bank uh, country offices, their work, Afghanistan, Brazil, China, Ghana, Poland, Uganda. And it focuses on ending extreme, extreme poverty and promoting shared prosperity. It's grounded on the premise that an inclusive society must have institutions, structures, and processes that empower communities so that they can hold their governments accountable. So you understand, business and politics go together. So the whole idea of political economy, really something that we must, and, and I don't know why uh, clergy ordained people on the continent, this whole division between religion and business is really one of the curses uh, of this religion and the compartmentalization, the dichotomization that Europe has benefited uh, us on the continent, that you, that Religious leaders in their theological training, they do not really read political economy. It's a, it's, a, it's a sad thing. It's really, really sad. Because how can you lead a people and do not know uh, their, how they live uh, in their economies and how they can build wealth? So in this book, the conviction is that people take part in society. People take part in society. This whole idea of inclusion through markets, services, and spaces, markets, services, and spaces. So for me, as I read this, the question became, how then do faith places, or for that matter, faith traditions, engage in politics and business in a way that creates inclusive societies? So that, for me, is now the question. Ways in which faith places, faith traditions, because of faith, if they have any, they seek to create inclusive societies. What does that mean? That people, individuals and people groups are able to participate uh, in markets, services, and spaces. This book really does clarify how that is. And as I've been thinking about the work we have done on transformational business, what it is that we seek to see. And it is this, and the book clarifies, that you've got to focus on improving ability, opportunity, and dignity. Ability, which is what education does, opportunity, education opens up, ability, skills, ability, ability, opportunity, and dignity. Dignity as a word imported in the World Bank language, dignity, which focuses on notions of respect and recognition. For if people's abilities, opportunities are enhanced and their dignity, they participate more effectively in markets, in services, and spaces. And therefore, it is possible that faith places can contribute to the individuals and the stories that my dear brother has told are very, very clear. The whole question of access to markets. We began to talk about dealing with the question of unemployment. How do you deal with unemployment? You know, how do you deal with it? 
it's not by just skilling. It's that people produce and they can access market. We've been having deep conversations around the coffee uh, value chain. Simply as an example, a dear, dear brother uh, committed to faith goes into a community and realizes that coffee is a very, I mean, Uganda is uh, the home, by the way, uh, the home of Robusta coffee. Uh, Robusta coffee is, is ours. Uh, uh, but it will surprise you uh, that the most marketed coffee in my country is Nescafe. And one of my visions is to kick Nescafe out of Uganda. Uh, uh, because we produce, coffee is grown, you know, and Arabica. Uh, uh, I mean, how it is that coffee is mostly drunk uh, in Europe and not in Africa is, uh, confuses me. Uh, when all coffee, its home is Africa, you know, Ethiopia. And so anyway, the coffee value chain is a very interesting one. So this dear friend, dear, dear man, because of faith, goes into a community and recognizes that you must standards and everything. So the coffee value chain from the farm to the market, to the supermarket. And I could tell the story how because of his commitment to that, communities were completely transformed. I mean, agriculture is a place for transforming our societies. And it's amazing how if you are committed to uh, helping people access markets, access services, education, healthcare, but people can't access services, education, healthcare, if they don't have money in their pockets. And they don't have money in their pockets if they're not selling anything. And the reason why aid doesn't work, it does not spur production or productivity. It's just totally useless uh, in terms of, uh, and uh, we can talk about uh, the guys who suggest that the only way to uh, improve Africa's fortunes is more aid, more aid. You know those economists uh, who are based in Washington and so on. Um, no, I mean, of course they have to do it because they are paid to do it by, you know, so you impoverish Congo, steal all its uh, uh, coltan, which is in our phones, uh, comes from Congo. Uh, diamond comes from, so one of the reasons for aid, it's, it's part of this conspiracy to keep Africans poor, to keep the poor poor. That's part of the conspiracy. But I think that if people of faith were committed to what faith is all about, surely, and the stories that Kim has told, give hope, that the hope for places such as Africa and elsewhere, possibly, possibly, is rediscovering faith and ignoring religion. Thank you very much. All right, uh, why don't we take one or two questions and then we'll take a coffee break. Vincent, you're up. Who's Joe? Thanks. Um, Thanks very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, just a few words about my background and why I may sound a little passionate when asking my questions. Um, I've been crisscrossing Africa and covering African crisis for 30 years now, uh, armed conflict, humanitarian catastrophes, and so on and so forth. Um, and I've been, for good or bad reason, blacklisted in at least uh, half a dozen countries. I mean, the white reporter blacklisted is something I love. Um, apart from that, uh, it's anecdotal but funny. Uh, I got a few, a few years ago a war correspondence award, um, not very important, but for the coverage of the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda. You know, uh, LRA is um, so um, how messianic um, militia, I mean, name it a bunch of killers. But a very, very good example of dire instrumentalization of the religious factor. Because Joseph Kony, uh, the founder and uh, head uh, at the time of LRA, who, uh, appeared among uh, his followers as a re embodiment of Christ himself. So it was um, okay. Um, and another anecdote is that I published uh, last spring a book entitled Tyrants. The Tyrants of Africa, the Mysteries of Postcolonial Despotism, and chapter two is about uh, Idi Amin Dada as an archetype of um, the uh, African uh, despot. Um, uh, so, um, the problem I have is very simple. Uh, and with all due respect to the very, very impressive presentation of uh, Professor Kim, of Dr. Kim, uh, what I've seen in Africa in the past 30 years is what works, works at the local level. 
And, but the problem is that you cannot indulge in small is beautiful. Because the, the elephant in the room, and uh, Bishop Zach in, somehow invited the Pashiderm here, the elephant in the room is politics, Mr. Politics. What I've seen is that everywhere in Africa you have a vibrant society which tries things at the local level, but you have die-hard despots who either try to co-opt these actors or annihilate their initiatives because they are perceived as a danger, as a threat to their own power. So, I mean, you cannot just uh, consider the future of Africa if you do not consider the failing states uh, and if you do not consider the political angle. Um, and um, recently there was um, uh, Africa France summit in Montpellier. And uh, our national Jupiter, uh, Emmanuel Macron, wanted to break with the tradition. So he decided to invite no chief of state except himself, the host. <laughs> and he decided to have a taboo-free conversation with a dozen of uh, young and energetic leaders of Africa. The problem here is that you, a new cult about the entrepreneurs and the vibrant uh, civil society, but again, it bumps into political reality. And the same Macron would rush to N'Djamena to endorse a dynastic succession when his friend uh, Idris Deby, no from Chad, was killed. Uh, and, and you know, I mean, we are in this contradiction. Now on the number two, and I will finish with that, I think the problem we have in most of the Western countries, and we are talking about uh, religious concept, is uh, ironicism. I mean, we have a post-colonial inhibition to address cl clearly, for example, the authoritarian regression of Africa today. When I wrote a book about that topic 10 years ago, I was just insulted because I was an Afro-pessimist. No, I mean, it's what I've seen on the ground, and I'm, I'm neither an Afro-pessimist nor an Afro-optimist. I try to be an Afro-realist. And, 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 you know, uh, what happened after my book came out in last spring, in the meantime, we had five military coups, what I call uh, vintage putsch, you know, the old-fashioned way with a guy in military fatigue uh, who appears on the screen at 8 p.m. and reading, you know, painfully uh, 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 pre-written stuff. I mean, uh, that's reality today. And I just want to jump very shortly to the other part of it, faith and religion. And obviously, I buy the, uh, the insistion made by, by Bishop Zach about uh, my own face uh, as coming from a, a Catholic family, Northern France, blah, blah, uh, has been challenged by three events. Uh, Rwanda, I was mm. covering genocide there. I spent weeks and weeks in Rwanda during and after. And once, once I, I was talking with the Bishop of Kibuye, and he told me in Rwanda, he told me, well, you know, um, I protected um, a Tutsi family during one week or so. And then my friends from the Utu militia came to me and said, you know, these guys, uh, they are spies. Uh, they are cock rocks, as they, they call them uh, in, in uh, Kenya Rwanda, and so on and so on. So I decided to denounce them. God is a bishop. And he had no problem admitting that he denounced those he was protecting for one week or so. I was so shocked that whenever you had on Sunday morning people coming out of the church with a nice outfits, the question was whether they were uh, just Christians or killers. And, and that challenged in my face a lot. Number two, pedophilia in the church. It took so long to, you know, get the extra mile uh, to recognize what happened, and it's still on the way. Third thing, very shortly, once I had to um, uh, improvise a report in Vatican, it's not in my area of coverage, but uh, yeah, there was a missing colleague and so on and so forth. If your face can survive one week in Saint-Pierre-de-Rome uh, while uh, working on the intrigues there, or the political calculations of the plot to uh, unsettle Pope Francis, if your faith can resist that, you are saved. I mean, and so there are three uh, challenges. And I will finish with something about, um, I, I started with instrumentalization of the, the religious factors. Um, what I've seen in Africa is some very positive things. 
during early 90s, we had this, you know, trend of uh, national sovereign conferences in Benin first and then everywhere. And very often, uh, the bishop conference or one archbishop was really instrumental in making it work. And, and frankly speaking, it was a challenge, you know. And so this is good. When they send uh, teams of observers in this never-ending struggle against vote reading and fraud and so on, they are very efficient. And that's the reason why uh, generally the power doesn't like them very much and we don't give them the, the, the credential necessary to do that kind of job. This is good. On the other way, you have a very problematic example. When you are a candidate, you run for presidency in Senegal, the first visit you pay uh, is for, to the uh, Caliph General, the General Khalif of the main brotherhoods, you know, Tidiane, Mourid, and so on. Um, when you have, um, uh, in the Central African Republic, the former president, Francois Bozizé, who is still hanging around, helping to prevail again once, um, he was officially the reverend pastor of the Celestial Church of Christ. W what is the problem, basically? It's just that the essence of his power was not temporal, but spiritual, or sacred, if you prefer. And you have the sense that, in fact, his religious so-called legitimacy was prevailing on these democratic credentials, which, by the way, were extremely poor. So, I mean, that's um, the problem here is that you have this the phenomenon that um, political actors who are still in power today first want to suppress whatever might endanger their political uh, basis, or uh, they try to invite God at their table to reinforce, to strengthen a failing and ailing legitimacy. And I think, if, again, if the Western world doesn't address that straight in the eyes, we are going nowhere. Thank you. It's a powerful question. Um, and we have uh, five more in the queue. So can I suggest, we only have one pastor in the room. Maybe um, uh, Bishop Zach, do you want to navigate that one? We'll get one more question in, and then we'll take a quick coffee break and come back. Um, I, I take it more as a comment mm -hmm. and um, really adding uh, to the conversation. Um, but just to say this, that religion hides faith. Religion suggests that faith is spiritual, is, you know. But faith is visible. Faith is tangible. And the reason for quoting this World Bank report is that without using the language of faith, is that if somebody is inspired by faith, he seeks the dignity of all people. The whole question of recognition, respect, recognition and respect, so anybody who portends, who claims to have some faith and doesn't show in their life, in their leadership, ways of affirming, working towards, improving, enabling the dignity of all people, that person is instrumentalizing religion. Now, um, um, and, and it could be a community and so on. And because religion is such a powerful mobilizing force, why? Because it creates identities. My religion is a potent force for decimating populations, and we have a long history of that, and so on and so forth. So I think that faith is visible. I think that anybody who says, I have faith, very often they're just religious people who are seeking to instrumentalize religion, and we can, I can give you names of all sorts of them, including Chiruba. You know, after Chiruba uh, stepped, you know, was, uh, uh, lost an election, Chiruba was a first candidate for, for jail because he was a thief. I mean, we have many thugs who are in charge of political power on the continent. And, and by the way, having said this, there are also thugs in Europe and, and elsewhere. So just so you know, this is not a conversation about Africa only and Asia. I mean, these are human beings who steal, who use their public office to steal. Uh, but we are discussing Africa, okay? Uh, because I do not want people to have this sense. Uh, and I won't speak about anybody in, in, in America. I will not, please. I will just not go there. It's, it's a human thing that has happened. So I think that faith is visible. It's, it's evidenced in how people 
cohere this whole idea of inclusion. David Brooks, New York Times. Okay, I want to take a once in a lifetime chance to defend religion to a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> and I say it with the, first with the supposition that every religious person I know is often disgusted by their own institutions. Uh, and, but that's because the institutions are, are human institutions. And so they're going to be flawed. The second thing to say is that in my reading of history, religions don't fight each other, groups fight each other. And religions happen to be a group, so sometimes they fight each other. But more often, nations fight each other, and more often, kinship. And religions have a tendency to fight each other less than nations, in my reading of history. And Rabbi Sachs wrote a book about this. Um, but I do say whether we have good religion or bad religion matters, and that we need a good religion. My favorite definition of a commitment, making a commitment, is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. So Jews love their God, but they keep kosher just in case. Uh, and we need those structures of behavior. The second thing religions are really good at is passing down knowledge and discernment. And frankly, I think Jews and Catholics do this a little better than Protestants. Uh, but it's the wisdom of the ages that gets passed down in the interpretation of the Bible. And I think religions are just fantastic in that. And if you seek to have a personal encounter with God without the history of thought and the, what the history of theology without the history of doctrine, it's hard. <laughs> and it's probably going to be, in my view, weak uh, and not durable. Fourth, religion organizes knowledge across generations. And a religion, the institutions, like any institution, is if you want to make change, you have to make change across from generation to generation. And you need an institution. And finally, I'm going to read a quote from a passage from a friend of Jeff and mine. Um, on how religion, how the institutions of religion changes you. And this quote is from David Wolpe, who was a synagogue out in Los Angeles. He writes, spirituality is an emotion, religion is an obligation. Spirituality soothes, religion mobilizes. Spirituality is satisfied with itself, religion is dissatisfied with the world. And I do think that the hard call and the obligations of institutional religions that is felt by monks and nuns who do these heroic things is necessary for, for faith to be healthy. And that has been my personal, personal experience. So that, that's my quick defense of religious institutions and the necessity for them. And I understand I come from a certain background, you come from a very different background, but that, that would be my defense. Your people are also religious, do you want to weigh in? No, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't need to comment on that, but maybe just to pick up something uh, from, from Vincent. Um, look, there's corruption everywhere. Mm. You know, you want to see corruption, well, just think about the LIBOR scandal. That's affected billions of people around the world. You want to come to my country, Malaysia, and see the kind of scandal we have. So corruption is everywhere. And therefore, for me, corruption should not be the excuse for us not doing anything. Um, so, so we can wait forever until you can have stable governments and, and good leaders and so on. Well, we could do that. Or we could go in and the way we do it is really to not get governments to be involved. If you go into the slums and you're building businesses in the slums, these small, medium-sized enterprises, they leave you alone. You know? So we stay below the radar. We go in and build these kinds of businesses. The, the, the time when we get into trouble is when we become too successful. Okay. When we have just 100 schools in the slums in Nairobi, government said, carry on. It's great. When we became 400 schools, <laughs> the largest chain in Kenya, we were problem. But we, we, we we're prepared to tackle that. That's fine, right? But uh, so I, I have taken a view that there are certain countries that are still, for us as investors, are just not stable enough for us to go and do things because our investment period is 10 to 12 years. Uh, so we, we, we need to be realistic about that. But at the same time, we can't, I can't no longer uh, sit on a sideline and say, you know, it's corrupt and therefore, you know, you, you don't go and do anything. I think there are, there are investors willing to take those kinds of risks now to go and use their, their business skills to, to, to create these kinds of, of, of opportunities uh, for, for locals. 
Um, good religion. Uh, David, I, um, good religion, bad religion. Um, I wish we could have this conversation in my vernacular because then the conversation would be different. Because then we would have to work hard to find the word for religion. We would then have to find a word for spirituality. Both of which are nearly impossible to, tr to find equivalents in my mother tongue. And I have come to the conclusion that language matters. Language either opens or obscures. Language not only describes reality, but language creates reality. And uh, so, so that's the first point, is that yes, admittedly different contexts, but I think we will be better when we start talking more honestly. Um, I think one of the, and bear with me if I say this, one of the challenges for many of us in Africa, we, we have Europeans and North Americans and so on, telling us what is right and what is wrong, including journalists and so on. So I plead for a genuine conversation in other languages as well, not just the English language, and not just the heritage of Europe and so on. Because what I'm sharing with you is the story of Africa, that we had the language spirituality might help, traditional spiritualities, I prefer to use the word faith because it's accessible in any of the languages, uh, I prefer the word faith. So in fact, I could turn it around and talk about good religion, bad religion, and I would say, good religion seeks to enable faith. My anecdote, so I was being trained for ordination, and I will ever be grateful for this mentor of mine, who said this to me in clear terms. Zach, you are being ordained into an office of religion. You are going to be part and parcel of a religious institution, a religious structure. And I was very clear, I was willing, I was not, you know, it was, a, it was a choice I made. And I'm still a bishop by choice, you know. So it's, however, this mentor of mine said this. He said, provided you recognize that the reason for all those institutions and structures are to enable faith, to enable faith. And he said, beware of the tyranny of religion. He challenged me to constantly in all my life seek to enable and encourage faith. And I'm still working at it, trying to understand how faith works within these repressive, oppressive, but the history of injustice and plunder grounded in religion is too much for us to ignore, especially in the story of Africa. And I invite us to consider the burden of religion on the continent of Africa and continuing to entrench and exacerbate and make worse a situation of a people who uh, not only were enslaved, but the plunder of the North, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, all in the name of, by the way, I can even give you more recent examples of more new forms of plunder, you know, that are organized around the whole question of religion. So yes, I completely agree. Bad religion, good religion, uh, good language, but maybe what about if we gave up the word religion and find different words? Because the word religion, we don't have it, and we did not have it for centuries in Africa until Christianity came, until Islam came. Religion was introduced, that language. So can we take a break from it? What would that look like? We've got four questions in the queue. Let's see how far we can get. First of which um, is Carolina uh, Vigura. Perhaps. Okay, so my question to some extent continues on the David's question. Um, I, I would like to challenge you, Zach, a little bit on this division between faith and religion. Namely, the problem seems to be a little bit similar to the problem with ecumenism. Ecumenism is also a very beautiful idea, but when it boils down to details, it starts to be a problem. So, for example, when people start to ask whether Jesus was the son of God and God, God himself, or rather, was one of the prophets. And here the problems be basically began. And, and then when it comes to um, daily rituals and prayers, you might ask if you were, we are so ecumenical, what to choose actually in order to express one's, health, uh, one's, one's faith. 
Now, with your division between faith and religion, it seems that this uh, invitation of various worldviews goes even deeper. So I do believe that what, how you describe faith actually invites also people who, like me, are declared atheists, but at the same time, they claim that there is a kind of energy or spirituality or transcendence that basically connects us all. So this is a very stoic view. Yeah, this is a very stoic worldview. And I do believe that this division of yours very much invites also people like me. But then a problem begins, namely that when you look into the history of philosophy, those people who claimed that there is this kind of spirituality and they were philosophically thinking about it, they actually ended either alone or in very small groups. So there, is, there seems to be a kind of tension between the idea of faith and convincing a lot of people to join the same path. So my question is basically, do you think that with this division and with putting stress on faith, can you actually gather more people just with this very individualistic argumentation or would you rather need a new religion to do it? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, it's, there's a sense in which faith is impossible without community. Because humanity itself is, is community. So, A, your observation that uh, a conversation around faith is inviting, absolutely. And a conversation about faith does not seek by itself to convert or to persuade. Hopefully, it is to hear one another. It takes seriously people and their stories and is grounded in, so yes, the observation you've made about it is inviting, absolutely. And I have found that in the work, especially around social justice, uh, the work about the dignity of all peoples, conversations about faith are more liberating. There will not be agreement. Of course there will not be. And we do not seek agreement. Because once you seek agreement, then you are seeking homogeneity. You're seeking the path of religion. Because religion is about clear do's, don'ts, structures, behaviors, and so on. So it creates enough space for us to be different and yet to be able to be what I call seekers. Seekers. Uh, people ask me about myself and how I describe myself. And I say, actually, describe me as a seeker. And I'm in the good company of other seekers. And my seeking is within the context of the story of Jesus. That does not exclude anybody else trying to seek. So yes, it's an invitation to, be, to recognize the human in each one of us. And back to the question of dignity, 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 recognition, dignity, respect, dignity, uh, I do not need to convert you. There's a, a text, is an, an essay that was written by... Uh, I think it's Professor Gene Green, and it was awesome when I read it. It's, it's the death of mission. It's the death of mission. And one of the reasons I loved it is because mission and missionaries and everything of that is conquest, and we want to persuade, you want to change people. And in that essay, um, uh, Gene Green has a deeper reflection on the dangers of mission and what it did and all that. The idea that people must be persuaded to what you believe and, and, and stand for. So, yeah, it's a journey. I agree. Okay, uh, we've got um, Jeff Goldberg, Katrin Benhold, and Anne Elizabeth. Jeff. Sort of a, a, a short but big question. Um, both of you have alluded to this issue of aid versus business development. Um, prompted a, a memory 25 years ago, probably, uh, in the, Zach and I were talking about this place last, the Sheraton and Kampala, that a woman, uh, an American aid official, uh, who told me that she was working on democratization of Uganda, uh, democracy programs in Uganda. And uh, she said she spends about six months a year at the Sheraton. Um, it's a very nice hotel, by the way, on a hill birds and gardens. Um, 
And I said, what do you do for the other six months? She said, well, I have a, a small vineyard in California. And I said, but what's, what is your work? The rest? She said, no, I just spend time in my vineyard. And I kind of must have had a face on or something like that. Because she said, well, I don't want democracy to come too fast to Uganda, um, <laughs> which is the most honest thing an aid person has ever said. But, she must have been joking. Uh, <laughs> She was joking, not joking. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean. It, obviously, she would never say that in public, and obviously, she partially doesn't believe that. But partially, the incentives in her life were such. Um, you, you know, uh, I came up with a slogan back in the day where, where I, looking at different aid workers, I realized that the theme for many people was carpe per diem. Um, <laughs> the um, the uh, and, and so and, and I'm not blaming. I mean, people come, people go to this work for good reason. Um, but when it becomes a career rather than a mission, um, the incentives become different and then people have to live and they have to support themselves. And so the question is, how, how do you, I mean, this is a very large question, but you, you in particular have mentioned this, you, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you break apart or how do, you, how do you dismantle the structures that make aid and aid organizations permanent in all of these places. I mean, you, you're, the data was pretty convincing that it's not working on some, you know, meta level, at least. So what, what do you, I mean, it's a question for both of you. Um, how do you change the incentives uh, for, for Western aid so that it becomes more of a teach a man to fish rather than just constantly providing fish? You know, someone's rightly said, if poverty is your business, you want more poverty, not less, right? And, and uh, sadly, you know, the, the aid industry is huge. Lot, lots of vested interest uh, involved and, and, and so on. Um, I think there is a place for aid. I think there's a place for charity. Uh, we work with a whole lot of foundations, but it's educating them to say that there is a more sustainable, better way if you really want to see transformation. And I think that's, that's the message. So our main investors are now the sovereign wealth funds. And they're taking part of their aid dollars now to do this kind of investing. We have the responsibility now to show that this can be done at scale uh, and sustainably, and hopefully to see more of that capital that they would add, had allocated to aid coming to this because our pitch to them is pretty simple. You give aid, you don't know where the money goes, right? You, you, do, you know, your responsibility is only to get the, the, the funds out. It's never about reporting on, on impact and, and, and outcomes. But if, if you invest this kind of way, you can come kick tires, it's sustainable. And if we do it well, we give you your capital back. If we do it really well, we give you some returns as well. And then you can recycle it. So, so the, the message is pretty simple, and we're getting through to, to the sovereign wealth funds. So our biggest investors are the CDC, this DFID in the UK, uh, Norfund, FMO, uh, European Investment Bank has set up a social impact fund, uh, Exxon Insurance, JP Morgan Social Finance. So we are seeing more and more uh, becoming, saying, okay, I understand what you're doing now, and this, you've shown that you can work. So it's, it's now up to us uh, who are on the front line to, to show that this approach can work and hopefully over time to persuade them to, to, to use their aid budget in, in, in a more sustainable way. Can I just ask a quick, quick follow-up? Sure. How do you convince idealistic 20-somethings who are mistrustful of capitalism that actually sovereign wealth funds <laughs> Or where you should be going to work if you're trying to change the structure of poverty in a place like Uganda. I well, mean, that seems like a hard slog. Well, we, 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 we you know, the transformational business, uh, Jeff, is, is a network of disillusioned philanthropists, repentant bankers, and repentant venture capitalists. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and we just run these conferences and we persuade people to come on a holiday in the slums with us. And it's, it's taking them onto the ground that suddenly, you know, they, they, they understand. And they, we've got a whole load of, of idealistic 20-year-old guys and, and, and girls out there 
wanting to build these kinds of businesses. Uh, so I think it's possible. And we, you know, we lecture at, at business schools to try and say Wall Street's not the only place for your careers. You know, there are other places where, where we can use your, your skills and your talents. So yeah, it's, it's slow. But uh, you know, we, I, I just last month did a whole session for 700 bankers uh, on Zoom just to show them that there is, there is something else that you can offer your clients, right? There is something else um, that's more sustainable than, than their philanthropy. So I think, I, I think you know, it, it, we need time. We need time. But what's very interesting also, Jervis, is that in the West, we have a certain prejudice. You know, when, when, when we say China and Asia, we think business, we think investments. As soon as you mention Africa, we think aid. And that's that prejudice that we still need to try and uh, demolish, I think. You know, Kim's uh, slide about poo earlier today <laughs> reminded me of the old Michael Novak line that if you uh, go about poverty <clears throat> alleviation the way that most of us do, you are always trying to feed the horses. That's not quite right. You're trying to feed the sparrows by feeding the horses. Um, in other words, that there's this poverty industrial complex that wins government contracts again and again and again, and a little bit gets to the sparrows eventually, but really much of it in the pass-through goes to the, uh, comes to mind. I'm going to weigh on quickly, and then we'll get to Anne Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> the business, 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 um, empowering communities, empowering individuals and communities, nothing does it like business. Uh, so investing in business, it's what puts money in people's pockets. Aid does not put people money in people's pockets. So um, business, business, business. But secondly, and I was having this conversation with uh, uh, Kim, and we still are going back and forth. Um, we can't be naive about the power of governments and politics. So the, this report focuses attention on ensuring that governments are more accountable. Let me explain by very short story. So I interfaced with the USAID mission in Kampala when we were busy trying to suggest to them that suppose USAID mission reduced their funding of the healthcare budget in Uganda. What would that do to the current uh, very uh, kleptocratic, you know, thieving state that Uganda is? Why? Because 80% of the healthcare budget of Uganda is paid for, is funded by USAID mission, 80%. What does that do? We have an unaccountable government. It doesn't have to account to the people. Somebody else is paying for it. So imagine how, if they removed that, I mean, the entire HIV and AIDS intervention in Uganda is paid for by USAID mission. So governments don't have a responsibility over their own people. We are paying taxes, they are stealing them. The other point to make, aid money is the easiest to steal. Uganda has a huge story of Gavi funds that are, were stolen, the people who stole them, government ministers supported by people in power, back and forth. So aid simply doesn't make sense. And how we need to communicate this. And this is the kind of work that I plead with you journalists, need to say more need to say more, because it's not said. And there are economists who have made a living. <laughs> poverty is their biggest business, so they are happy for more poverty. So yes, it is possible. But if we have more accountable governments, so the, there is no shortcut that people's participation in spaces, this, people's participation in the political future of their countries, and that's hard work. I have a few businessmen who are faith uh, venture entrepreneurs and so on. One of my challenges with them is they are very naive about politics. Very naive about politics. And they can't survive once they begin to be very successful. May I suggest that we take two last questions? Uh, Catherine and then Anne Elizabeth and then we'll wrap. Uh, Catherine. So, um, Bishop Zak, I met another activist uh, from Uganda last week in Glasgow. I met Vanessa Nakate, who um, in fact made it, I think, to the cover of Time this week, and is really kind of the new, maybe African Greta, um, for lack of a better term. And she made a very powerful case that in addition to those historic injustices and plunder 
um, that you alluded to, there's now another layer because of the climate challenge. She educated me uh, about the fact that, you know, four out of five, the five most affected countries in the world by the consequences of, the adverse consequences of climate change are in Africa, but Africa only accounts for 3% of emissions historically. So there's now a situation where all the kind of statistics you quoted about school dropout rates, about poverty, about even teenage pregnancy, all of those things are being exacerbated by climate-related natural disasters that lead to the you know, farms being washed away, young girls being mar married off early, you know, girls in particular, but boys also dropping out of schools early. All the sort of social ills that Africa is struggling with anyways has now this additional challenge, challenge layered upon itself. And so her point was very forceful that Africa needs money. It needs lots of money. She didn't call it aid by any means. It's more like a reparation almost. She says, you know, 100, 100 billion, as we all know, dollars per year were promised by the rich nations by 2020. None of that money has arrived. I struggle to see how, you know, we can do this without money from the West. I mean, maybe let's not call it aid, but I don't see how small decentralized initiative can, initiatives can cope with this additional challenge that African countries, and clearly Uganda, with apparently one of the fastest changing climates in the world, can cope. So I'd be curious to hear how the climate debate feeds into your challenges. Is it an opportunity, perhaps? And also, perhaps, how it can be leveraged in a more faith-based kind of approach to rally people to the activism. And Elizabeth? Vincent, can you hit uh, that oh, button, please? Yeah. Cheers. I ought to know this after two days. Thank you. Now, first of all, really, I would like to thank both Bishop Zach and, and uh, Kim because uh, what was probably absent from our conversations yesterday was the, the feeling of hope. And both of you, in different ways, have given us hope in, in both spiritual and concrete ways, and these marry very well. So that's really something that I find very impressive. And also, I like the fact that you're taking sort of difficult questions, which is going to soften the blow for mine. Uh, before that, I really like to support David Brooks's view on religious institutionals. And if the, uh, uh, I have to, being French, I have to bring the French secular perspective on this. I, my father was uh, 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 not only secular, but avowed atheist. And uh, in two instances, he bowed to those institutions. One was that when I was at school in Britain, and, and the headmistress said, I know that you're not religious, and should Anne Elizabeth go to chapel in the morning at 7.30? And he asked, well, what happens if she doesn't go? And uh, the answer was, well, she gets up later than anybody else, in which case my father immediately said, she must go, <laughs> <laughs> which gave me the Book of Common Prayer and, and the King James Bible, which essentially taught me half, you know, the, the structure of beautiful English. So that was something, and I think he knew, because he, he knew that. And the other thing was much more pointed, which was uh, he told me, you have to read the Bible, because otherwise you'll never understand anything in a museum. And in terms of memory and in terms of the institutions, I think, I think the popes knew perfectly well what they were doing when they were commissioning such great artists. And uh, that is the, the religious art is something that has shaped our music, our art, sculpture, memory. Uh, so uh, the, uh, you need great institutions for that, and sometimes you even need rich institutions for that. Uh, my question is um, from a, a sentence that Bishop Zach just said and, uh, during his presentation at the end of it. And you said, and I may have misunderstood, uh, this situation is part of the conspiracy to keep Africa poor. Who are the conspirators and what would be the conspiracy? Okay, maybe one minute apiece on a lot of hope and then a conspiracy there. Yeah. Uh, a nice build up and, and on climate and then we'll wrap in about three minutes, okay? You're up. Um, the wars are around resources. Um, the natural resources of Africa, whether it's fresh water, minerals, everything, everything, um, is there. And the numbers, I don't have to get into them. You guys can do your homework and research. It's amazing. So the extraction of these minerals in Congo, or the diamond of Sierra Leone, I could go on. 
the only way to ensure that they do it uh, cheaply is by ensuring that there is instability. So Congo, as a country, DRC, uh, it's a conspiracy. It's, a, it's really an alliance between uh, uh, plunderers from north and dictators in the south. So they have an alliance to make sure that Congo is unstable, uh, to make sure that Sierra Leone diamonds can be effectively stolen, and I could go on. So absolutely, it's an alliance of plunderers, and there's a long history to it, and the Europeans have a great experience in it, uh, because the Europeans made sure uh, they could do whatever they did to Africa in the slave trade and on and on. But this is not just Europeans, it's human experience. I mean, I've told you about uh, General Museveni and all the other. Uh, so it's, it's really greed. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alliance of greed and plunder. And uh, I'm not the first to talk about it. It's all over. Now, nations benefit from this. The transnational corporations. I mean, we can talk about the oil companies. Uh, we can talk about Total in, uh, in Uganda, <laughs> you know? Uh, we can talk about all these. So yes, it is, it is real. Now, my argument is that if um, faith-based uh, institutions were more aware of this, uh, and part of the thing is ignorance, ignorance. We, people are ignorant that this is actually happening, uh, and this pretension of uh, uh, doing good for Africa, um, uh, it should really be over. So yes, there's a lot, and I think that, again, uh, much more work into it. Why should Congo still be unstable? Why uh, the Somali question? Why uh, the River Nile and the conflict along the River Nile? Uh, all that. What are the interests of the French? What are the interests of the Americans? What are the interests of the Russians? Uh, all of the wars you fight among us yourselves here, all that I think is true. I, I, I'd like to sort of follow up on this because that the situation is exactly as you describe, I have absolutely no doubt. That the, the companies and even some of the local rulers think that instability is serving them best when actually they are, they could be victims of a coup and they often are, as many of us mentioned, uh, were victims of coups. Uh, there's the, uh, the, the sort of anarchic demographic growth that you've described with the effects on the country and with the uh, fall down effects on, on the rest of the world because of migration. All of this shows that it's to use a fashionable word, completely unsustainable. And I can't see, when you say conspiracy, uh, I mean, and I can see lots of sort of blocks of interests working towards that slightly more blindly than anything, but the, the, the whole world of conspiracy would mean that there are actually sort of a few dozen people deciding this. It's, it's a very weighted word. All right. Um, so when Africa was being colonized, there are a few people who sat and agreed. Oh. Yeah. It's, the, it's King there. Leopold, I have no brief for King Leopold, especially you talked yeah, about yeah. Congo. So, At that time, yes, but today. Oh, even today. I, I wish it was not true, but actually even today, uh, the way these corporations are established. But it's the hard work we must do. Uh, I think what you're challenging me is the evidence. And, uh, no, it's, it's the idea that it's, it's masterminded by a conspiracy, a, a bunch of conspirators. And just by way of reminder, you know, the bus has these two seated sides of the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, together. Sort Happy it out by the time we get to the villa. Uh, so we on the question of the environment, just oh, very, yes, very yes, quickly. Yes. Um, the no doubt um, that that is the case as described by, uh, uh, um, what's her Catherine, name again? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, Vanessa. Catherine. Vanessa uh, in, oh, in sorry, Glasgow. Vanessa, I'm sorry. Um, holding, I would go back to holding our governments accountable um, because the, 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 the abuse of the environment, again, is, is really an alliance of uh, these governments. I mean, I can tell you the story of the decimation of uh, forests in Uganda. And the real reason is that you have an irresponsible government. It's just not doing what it should do to protect. Um, Kampala floods are unbelievable because the building regulations are not followed because you, and the people who are building in the swamps are people in government. So there's no way we, we've got to get more accountable governments. And I, I would disagree with her. It's not more money, it's more accountable governments. It's politics. 
that practical institutional application is probably a great place to land. Uh, thank you so much, Bishop Zach and Dr. Tom. Thank you.